actually. So, Judy, are you okay to get going? Yeah, I think I'm ready. Right. I assume everyone can hear me and I'll, see me. And we're all good. I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to you. And um, right, off you go, Judy. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just want to pre-warn you, this is the first talk I've done via the web. Um, so any technical difficulties, that's why. And you might see me glancing around a little bit, and that's because I've got different screens so that I can I can see what's going on. Um, but hopefully, hopefully we'll 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 ma manage this and uh, everything will work out okay. So I thought I would start by sort of telling you my background and how I got into astrophysics. So I did um, fairly standard GCSEs with a slant towards science, um, and then A levels I did physics, maths, and chemistry. And the only two of that that really really were important was physics and maths and further maths would have also been a good choice and at that point i didn't really know what i wanted to do um but i knew i liked astronomy so i went to durham and i did a four-year physics and astronomy degree um any flavor of physics degree would have worked so you didn't don't need the physics and astronomy part necessarily although you know it's nice to get into the stuff that you enjoy and astronomy was the part of physics i liked the rest of physics i wasn't a huge fan of but it worked out um, and it was part way through that that I realized that there was an option that you could have a career in astrophysics. You could have a career in research. I hadn't realized that before then. So I stayed in Durham and did a PhD, which was three years. Um, and in the UK, PhDs are typically funded. So you don't, as a student, you don't have to pay fees and you get a stipend for living expenses. So it's not adding to your student loan. I then moved to Southern California, where I did three years as a researcher. And then I went to Denmark for a couple of years um, where I was similarly a researcher, but I had more independence there because of the kind of funding. Then I moved back to Durham, um, thought I'd come back to the UK and I spent three years there. And during that time, I got a fellowship from STFC, which is um, the, one of the big research councils in this country. Um, and that fellowship came with an awful lot of funding. Um, and Lancaster basically went, that's great. Can we can we have you come here instead? And so I moved over and I've been here ever since. So just about a year and a half now I've been in Lancaster. So the talk that I want to, or the things that I want to discuss is the dark side of the universe. So dark energy, dark matter and dark galaxies or dust enshrouded galaxies. And let's get all on the same page to start with by thinking about our place in the universe. So I've marked on these four different um, graphics where we are. So here in Lancaster, we're usually on somewhere under a big cloud, so it seems sensible that that map of the globe is under a big cloud. Um, and then within the solar system, you know, we're the, the third planet from the sun. This is not at all to scale. The planets are much, much more spread out than that. Um, and then in the in our galaxy, the solar system sits on a spiral arm. Um, so this, if this is our galaxy, then our solar system sits kind of in a fairly innocuous part of it. And then the galaxy itself is only one of millions and billions. Um, and so this map over here is showing you where our galaxy lies within the local environment. So this isn't the whole universe by any stretch. This is just a small part of the universe. Um, but you can already start to see on there, each one of those dots is a galaxy, just how much structure there is out there and how many galaxies there are. So let's get a bit more of a sense of that scale. So between the Earth and the Sun, there's about 93, 000, uh, 93 million miles, which is about 12,000 times the Earth's diameter. Um, between the Sun and the next nearest star is about 170,000 times more than the Earth to the Sun. So each step we take is really large multiples of distance. And then if we want to go to our nearest big galaxy, we're 600,000 uh, 600, uh, times the sun to the nearest star. And of course, these numbers are really big and they're hard to grasp. So we tend to talk about light time, and light travel time. And so that's because light travels at a fixed speed. So in the time it takes you to blink, light could travel around the, um, around the Earth thousands of times. So instead, we tend to think that the sun is about 8.3 minutes um, away in the time that it would take the light to travel. The next nearest star is about 4.4 light years away. So it would take 4.4 light years for um, 4.4 years for light to travel between those two objects. And if we're talking about the next big galaxy, we're talking about two and a half million light years away. Um, and so 
really what we're talking about here is a light year is a distance. And I think that's one of the common misconceptions. A light year is not a time, it's a distance. And it's simply how far does light travel in a year? And it allows us to get a handle on these really big distances in space. So let's start thinking about how the universe is constituted. So in the late 1920s, um, there was a lot of discussion about whether these fuzzy, what they called island universes, were external to the Milky Way. So they could see these fuzzy patches in their telescopes, but didn't really know what they were or where they were. Um, and eventually, with the help of other people's data, um, Hubble published this graph showing the distance versus the velocity of a bunch of near, near galaxies to ours. And that shows that as you get further away, the galaxies move faster. And almost all of these galaxies are moving away from our galaxy. So the only way you can get that really, unless our galaxy is some kind of special central point, which is highly unlikely given how many galaxies there are, and we're really not special, and that lesson should have been learned hundreds of years ago, is if you're on a space that is expanding. And so if the space that you're on is expanding, then you can get that kind of trend in your graphs. And of course, the flip side of that is if the if the space is expanding now, that means it's getting bigger. So if you look to the past, it was everything was much closer together. And that's where this idea of the Big Bang came in, because if space is expanding now, then once upon a time, it was much, much smaller. And eventually you get a point. So that's where we kind of think of the history of the universe in, in broad strokes terms. And there's more evidence than just the expansion of galaxies for the Big Bang. And that, we can go into that later if, if there's questions about it. Um, but you, of course, the next thing you, you ask is, well, if, if the universe was really small in the past, what's going to happen in the future? So we get into this question of um, the expansion of the universe. And so really, in the late 90s, there was a lot of discussion about this, and there was three clear options that they could see. So if the universe was closed, meaning that there was more mass than the current velocity could overcome, then it would all shrink back down together. It could be open, meaning that it would just continue expanding forever um, and never crunch back down again. Or it could be flat, where these, these forces are finely, finely balanced. And the, the balance between gravity and expansion is really what controls this. And so in the late 90s, people put a lot of effort into trying to measure, is the universe open, flat, or closed? So one of the first sets of results from this was this one. So on the x-axis here, we're looking at redshift, which is really a measure of, amount of, of the amount of the universe has expanded since the light from these sources were um, was emitted. And then on the y-axis, we've got the distance to these objects. So these are supernovae, which are big explosions. So they, we can see them from quite a long way away. And all those points are data points. So those are all measurements. And then the lines are models. So if you've got a universe without dark energy, so if you've got a sort of normal universe, then you could have any of those black lines, but you can't go further up than the, the topmost black line. If you add in dark, dark energy to your, your universe model, you can increase a little bit. So you can, you can change up that y-axis a bit in these trends. And so that's why there's a difference between the black lines and the blue lines. And when they took these measurements, and if you analyze this statistically, you can, I mean, it's probably hard to see by eye, but if you, if you look at it statistically, those red points are on average above any of the black lines. So none of the universes without dark energy can fit the data. You have to have dark energy in, in order to explain this data. Um, so that was the, the kind of initial, this is where there's dark energy in the universe. And again, we've now got confirmation from a bunch of other um, observations that agree with this. We've got much more precise measurements of these kind of supernovae. Um, to, to narrow this down a bit more. And then the other component of the universe that you might have heard about is dark matter. Um, so this is missing mass that's needed to explain the motion of stars and galaxies and a bunch of other things. So if we look at a spiral galaxy, the stars are all rotating around the center of that galaxy. And there's a graph at the bottom here. This is um, distance on the x-axis and velocity on the y-axis. So as you go further and further out from the center of that galaxy, you expect the stars to slow down in their velocity. 
But if we do these observations, what you what you actually see is this. And so as you go further and further out, the velocity of those stars doesn't drop much. And you can see between the two, the rotation of these two simulations, the stars at the edge in the right hand one are moving much faster than the stars at the edge in the left hand one. And so that's um, one of the first indications of, of dark matter. And so dark matter was really this missing mass that allowed the galaxy to stay together without all those stars flying apart, even though when we observe it, if you add up all the mass that's in those stars, you don't get anywhere near enough to get this kind of flat, what we call velocity rotation curve. Um, and so we measure these velocities using spectroscopy. So we split the light up and then we can measure the emission lines from particular um, elements. So we might measure hydrogen emission lines or oxygen emission lines. So this is sort of an example of how it works. So the, um, the figure on the left here is just what that galaxy would look like normally. And then if we measure using hydrogen or oxygen, the amount of gas in that galaxy, you get this. So in the center, there's a lot of gas around the edges. There's not so much. Um, but we can measure the, the velocity of, the, of that gas in each one of these pixels. On this side is gas that's moving away from us. Blue on this side is gas that's moving towards us. And so this galaxy is kind of tumbling head over head over heels. And that's the that's what we see in that in that gas map. And then using this this same technique, we can also measure the age of the stars as well, using different emission lines from different um, elements. The other way that we know about dark matter, or one of the other ways that we know about dark matter is through gravitational lensing and gravitational lensing. This is where um, you have a very big mass and that mass distorts space time. So by having something heavy, space time itself is changed. And this is part of Einstein's theories, which means that if a beam of light comes along, then the path of that light is distorted by the change in space time. So the path of light is distorted by mass. And so in this image, you can see, or I hope you can, there's some arcs in it and some blue kind of scratchy lines. And they're all kind of Circ um, circling around the center of this galaxy cluster. So all these orange galaxies are bound together. Um, and so we can use the amount that those background galaxies and these arcs are distorted. So how much that light is distorted. We can use our laws of gra gravity to measure how much mass must be in the galaxy cluster. And again, if you add that up, it's much, much higher than you can get from the mass in the individual galaxies. So there must be dark matter in there as well. And then my favorite use of gravitational lensing is that it lets us see really tiny details, even in galaxies very, very far away. So this is, I think, probably my favorite astronomical image. Um, what you're seeing in the blue is um, a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. So that's optical light and that's a foreground single galaxy. And then what you see in the red and orange colors is um, in the far infrared. So we'll come on a little bit more into the electromagnetic spectrum next. But so it's different wavelengths of light, which is allowing us to trace two different galaxies. So the red is a background galaxy and that's measured by the ALMA telescope. Um, and this is just a zoom in. So you can see from this this zoom in panel, all of these little knots and wiggles and bumps and stuff. That's all real emission from the gas in this galaxy. And so gravitational lensing is allowing us to see really tiny details so it's about as if you were seeing the the resolution of a five pence piece in london from lancaster so to add all of that up if we look at the the entire constitution of the of the universe we've got only about five percent of the universe's normal matter so stuff like earth the, earth, the sun the stars um, Mostly it's dark energy, which is well over half, and then about 25, 26% dark matter. So I think now is a good point if there's any urgent questions. Okay. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is, is the galaxies themselves. So we can make universes in, in computers. And if we do that, we can basically train these computers to match the observations that we have of the local universe and then set them up with the physics of dark matter, 
dark energy and um, things like how does gravity work. And then we can run those simulations and see how well they look or how well they match the universe um, that we see around us. So we can look at different slices of the universe at different times in the past and see how this is compared. So this is one such simulation. Um, running the simulation took months and months of supercomputer time. And we're just seeing the different components in the single galaxy that's been built up um, here. So we started off at near the beginning of the universe and we're getting now towards the local universe. So we're building a galaxy that's something like the Milky Way. And we can see the gas components here um, and how the different bits of gas are falling in. But of course, we also want to, you know, test this compared to the observations. So let's think again about how the universe or how light has a fixed speed. So if we're looking at the sun, we're looking a few minutes ago. If we're looking at the nearest star, we're looking a few years ago. If we look over the whole universe, so if we look further and further back in time, we're, or if we look further and further back in space, so to more and more distant galaxies, because the light has taken much longer to travel to us, it's also like looking back in time. So it allows us to see the universe as it was billions of years ago. And across that time, galaxies evolve. So galaxies have been changing. They don't look the same today as they did near the Big Bang. And one way of visualizing that is um, through this um, little video. So this is showing real data. So what we're gonna do is zoom away from the Earth, further and further back in time. And we're gonna look at purely real data. So all of these dots of light that you can see now are real galaxies in the universe. And these shapes and colors um, and sizes are all exactly as they are in the real universe. And so as we're going back in time, you can start to see that the, the patterns in these change. So near to the Earth, near to the beginning, they're mostly blue spiral shapes or red ellipticals. And as we go further and further back, they overall, they get a bit smaller. The colors became, become a little bit less um, easily classified into just blue or just red. And the shapes become a lot more, uh, generally they're fuzzier. They might be a little bit less easy to characterize into just spirals or just these amorphous ellipticals. And as we get far, far enough back, we start to run out of galaxies altogether. And part of that is, is how sensitive our telescopes are. Part of that is um, just that the universe was a much quieter place right near the Big Bang. So that's all great and fine and dandy, but everything I've shown you so far is results that come from the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But of course, there's a whole, whole much more to it than that. So if you've got a remote control within grabbing distance of you, I would suggest you pick that up now. So if you get a remote control, uh, there we go, um, and you press one of the buttons and you look into it, you'll see that there's a little sensor at the end, and that's what sends the signal out. So if you just look at that with your eyes, you won't see anything, nothing will happen. If you press that button and you point it at a digital camera, sorry, I've got to line this up, you should be able to see that flashing purple. And that's because the digital camera on my computer is sensitive to slightly longer wavelengths of light than our eyes are sensitive to. So that's an experiment that you can do at home, you can do in your classrooms, whatever. Um, most digital cameras, phone cameras, eye device cameras, whatever, work. I think the latest version of iPhones, they've put an extra filter on the camera so you can't see it, but, but most others you can. Um, so, what do galaxies look like in different wavelengths of light? So in the optical, if we had giant space mirror eyes, telescope eyes, we would see the, the image in the center here. And so in this particular galaxy, you can see these spiral arms. You can see these dark patches in the spiral arms as well. Oh, my point has disappeared. OK, never mind. Um, in the ultraviolet, you can see it's a lot more clumpy. There's some really bright spots here, but, but not much else. Um, and then if we look in the left-hand image, this is the infrared, and that's really showing us a lot of the dust. So all the stuff that was dark in the optical image, 
has all of a sudden got really bright um, in the infrared. And so that infrared observation is allowing us to detect the dust, which is kind of like um, clumps of smoke or something in these galaxies, which blocks the optical light from reaching our eyes and it's re-emitted in the infrared. And so by doing ob observations in the infrared, we can start to see where there's patches of dust and that is some of the most active active parts of the universe so rather than looking at single close by galaxies i like to look at really distant galaxies and like to do surveys of patches of the universe so this is one such survey and this is the sort of thing that i work on so this is from the herschel observatory and what we've got there is a small patch of sky and each one of those dots is a distant galaxy that's forming new stars about 500 times faster than our Milky Way. And in fact, absolutely everything in that image is a galaxy. So even the patches that look dark in there aren't actually dark, right? So there's still galaxies even behind patches like this, this one here. There's no real background in this image. It's just that our telescopes over there can't separate how many galaxies are close together. And then the colors in this tell us a little bit about the temperature of the dust and how far away each of these galaxies is. And so because they're forming stars so much faster than galaxy evolution theories, because it's quite hard to get such high star formation rates. Um, so if we want to understand them, we obviously need more data than just a three color image like that. So the first thing you might do is go to an optical image, something like the Hubble Space Telescope. And if we do that in this patch of sky, you'll observe something like that final image there. And so it's quite hard to match what is it that's causing this really bright far infrared emission source in this optical image, because there's a whole bunch of faint galaxies in there. There's nothing that's really bright and booming that would speak to you and say, well, it's definitely that one because all that optical light has been absorbed by the dust and re-emitted in the far infrared. So we have to get a little bit more smart about it. And this is where we get to possibly my favorite telescope or observatory, and this is called ALMA. So ALMA is an array of 66 telescopes and they're all connected together. They all work together um, and they combine their data in such a way that you can spread them out up to over a couple of kilometers in Chile um, and their data gets combined and it, you effectively have a telescope that's a couple of kilometers wide rather than having one telescope that's just 12 meters wide. And so if we do that with these particular kind of really dusty distant galaxies, we get images like this. So in this, in this um, set of panels or set of pictures, the red is from the ALMA. So the red is the far infrared emission and the green and the blue is optical. So that's from Hubble. So that's the red is the dust, which is where there's brand new stars forming. And the green and the blue is the existing stars. Um, and so you can see if you only had the optical data, you probably wouldn't think there was anything particularly exciting going on with all these galaxies. And you certainly wouldn't think that all these galaxies had something in common because they've got such different shapes. But when we have the measurement from the far infrared of the, of the dust, you can start to see that they've all got the same thing in common. So we've got a very small core most of the time with brand new stars being formed in this quite small region. So that's all I wanted to, to kind of present today. The key takeaway points, most of the universe, about 95% is dark matter and dark energy. So only 5% five of, five of it is normal matter. Um, and really it's raw physics that helped us to detect those components and it's raw physics that has been used to study them. So even though we might like to think of astrophysics as being a bit different, we need the physical rules in order to, to understand what's going on. Big telescopes act like a time machine for the universe. So looking at galaxies that are far away is like looking back in time because we, we see those galaxies as they were when the universe was much younger. And using the full electromagnetic spectrum shows us a whole different side to the universe, which means that we've got to use all wavelengths of light if we want to see all parts of a galaxy or any other universal phenomenon. So that's where I want to stop. I don't know how you want to do questions, Phil. I'm just Good unmuting job. me. Um, okay. Um, we have some questions and, uh, in the chat. 
Yeah, go on, Dave. Hi, Julie. Um, Hi. Fantastic talk. The questions that are mainly coming up, uh, Darren and Husna have asked about, um, you know, what dark energy is as opposed to dark matter, and uh, so really about really the differences between these two things. Okay. My understanding was dark energy might have, I don't know if you can explain a bit more, some connection with the expansion of the universe. And did yeah, he take absolutely. over the term in Einstein's equation that he said was the biggest blunder of his life for ignoring or something? That's exactly it. So dark matter is basically matter that we can't see. So it doesn't emit electromagnetic radiation, which means our telescopes can't directly detect it. But it does act like normal matter. So it has got gravity. So if you can see gravitational effects, you'll be able to infer dark matter. So dark matter is really mass and, and gravity is an important thing. So it pulls stuff together. Dark energy is across the whole scale of the universe. And it's, it's exactly that. So it's this um, kind of fuzzy things that pushes things further apart. So it's an energy that spreads things out. And indeed, Einstein originally had a term in his equations in order to make the universe static, because when he was he was working on his theories, he didn't know that the universe was expanding that hadn't been discovered yet and so he thought that the universe was static because that's the way it was currently observed so he added this lambda term to his equations in order to create the universe and then of course they discovered that he called that term his biggest blunder because it really shouldn't have been there and his equations were telling him the universe isn't static, but he didn't believe them. And he added in this extra term without really having a good physical basis for it. So the dark energy pushes thing apart, things apart, dark matter pulls them together. Thanks, Julie. There's, there's a couple more questions if we've got time, Phil. Yeah, um, yeah we've got time. So, uh, and thanks for that explanation, Julie. Um, so basically, is there a difference between dark matter or is there dark matter energy here on Earth? And the other thing was a similar sort of idea. What are the candidates for dark matter? Because I remember things like machos and I did astrophysics at university. So, so I remember things like machos and wimps and looking for small dwarf uh, galaxies and planets as candidates for this stuff. And then they had to go to more exotic matter, didn't they? Yeah. And then again, the other. So the question really is, is are there any known candidates? I could just say one more thing, Julie, because you might be able to remind me. There's, there's, a, there's a famous galaxy where there's a picture that you can see all of this stuff going on, isn't there? Is there? I can't remember yeah. what it is. I have to find it. Do you know the thing I'm talking about? There's somewhere I do. It's the um, evidence. Over it's to you. Cluster, I think. Thank you. Um, and I've forgotten what it's called off the top of my head. Yeah, I can't it's remember. Got, it. Yeah, it's a galaxy people cluster. People are saying the bullet cluster. The bullet, bullet yeah, cluster. That, that's well, right. Thank you. Um, so now I've completely forgotten what your first question was. <laughs> Oh, sorry. So basically, the sorry, the question, Judy, is a really, um, it's to do with, is there any candidates that we're aware of for dark matter and dark right. energy? Um, and is there it, any on really it? Just variations of that question, really. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, so I'll start with, is there any dark matter and dark energy on Earth? Um, and the answer to that is dark energy is everywhere because it's part of the first time. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily doing anything to us specifically. Um, so it's just kind of underlying the entire fabric of the universe. Dark matter is sort of everywhere, but it's much more clumpy. So dark matter tends to be where there's strong gravity. So it will be in these big galaxy clusters because that's where there's lots of mass. It will be in, um, in, in galaxies and be affected by the motion of, of that whole galaxy. Um, so there probably is some in the in the solar system and near the near the earth but the density of dark matter is really low, really really low so on on universal scales the solar system is tiny and the the earth even tinier still and so there could be dark matter you know permeating the area of space that that we live in but that doesn't mean that there's necessarily enough of it for us to be able to to detect and you might depending what it is you could get a tiny number of particles per year that pass through the earth or something like that um, so there's nothing special about us that means it's here or not here. It's just that the density of it is so low that you only start to see its effects and feel its effects when you're talking about much bigger scales. In terms of candidates um, for dark energy, I think the, the jury is entirely out. I don't think there's any candidates for that that I'm aware of. 
for dark matter, yep, there's, there's experiments that are trying to detect it, but they're really just looking for particles that don't interact in any way other than gravitationally. Um, so that's obviously a hard, hard experiment to do. I don't know off the top of my head what the current thinking is in particle physics, whether they've got any good candidates. Um, I know for sure that things like, there was once a hypothesis that things like brown dwarfs or lots and lots of small black holes could do it. And indeed they would have semi the correct properties in that they don't emit light and they do have gravity. Um, but if you if you calculate how many there could be and how massively how massive they each could be, it's just not enough. So those have been discounted as candidates. But I'm not sure about what the, the current status of particle physics is as to whether there's any good candidates within that. Uh, you, thanks, Julie. Ask... There's lot, lots more questions. Kerry, you got some there? Please? I've got a couple of other questions. There are an awful lot of questions. Um, okay. So Will William's asking, is there dark energy or matter on Earth, or is Earth entirely made up of what we might think of as ordinary matter? Um, and Antonio would like to know, is the dark matter just extremely cold matter? Could it still emit in the microwave or radio part of the spectrum? OK, so the, the first question, is there any on Earth? There's, you know, we're not special, so there's probably some, but the density of it is going to be really, really low because we're very small compared to the whole universe. Um, so, you know, we might be affected by it, but it's all we've ever known, so we wouldn't know any different necessarily. It's not something that would seem strange to us. Um, is it very, is dark matter just very, very cold and that's why we can't see it? No, um, because we've looked, we've done observations at those sorts of wavelengths. Um, and in fact, the microwave wavelengths is a little bit of what I showed you there. So um, it's just not enough, unfortunately. It's, there's not something that simple. There is some hypothesis that maybe we've got gravity wrong on really, really big scales. And dark matter could just be our equations for gravity don't work on the biggest scales. And there's people that are actively working on that as a, a potential solution. Um, but none of them have managed to find a solution that works for all the experiments that do show dark matter. So some of them might be able to explain, say, gravitational lensing in clusters, but then not explain um, the velocity curves of galaxies. So those theories find it very hard to explain all of the, the, the lines of evidence that we've got at the same time, whereas dark matter explains them all together. Thanks, Julie. There's some more coming through. Carrie, are you going to take them? I was, I thought, Dave, or you were going to carry on. Sorry, because I've been listening. No, I'm happy. I'm happy to carry on. I'm just typing a few things about bullet cluster here. Because um, <laughs> there's really good images of that. But um, I mean, Rachel I... would like to know what will happen. Sorry, Julie. Rachel I, I, would like to know I can, what say, will I can happen grab a bullet cluster image if you want. Say that again. I can grab a, an image of the bullet cluster and explain it if you want. Oh yeah, that'd be fantastic. I, it's something okay. I remember reading about when I, you know, was looking into dark matter to teach, and uh, it's something. It's in my, you know, the clusters in my slide, but it is worth explaining, I think, because it has it all in there, doesn't sure. it? Different parts of it interacting. But thank you, thank you. Yeah. It'll take me a second to to find it, but we can do that. Okay, I, I'll just read through and get the other questions then for you. Okay. I, I've put some information in the chat for everyone about the bullet cluster. But again, Julie's going to tell us a bit more about that now. And I also put in, again, you can read this later, a nice little thing from the Perimeter Institute uh, looking at, you, uh, you use a wine glass. It's, you have to break a wine glass and, you know, I put some epoxy resin over it and make it safe and everything. But the um, it's very good for showing gravitational lensing. Yeah. Uh, and the effects it's, and how- It's a really nice way of doing it. Yeah. They, when I was at university, they bought an expensive lens uh, for us to do some experiments with. Apparently, it cost a lot of money. <laughs> right, let me show you this image of the bullet cluster. Um, okay, here we go. So, hopefully, that will show up in a second. There we are. Yeah, we can right, see so that. In this image, um, the kind of the galaxies, I guess, the, the sort of points of light are, are galaxies in optical optical wavelengths. So that's what you would see if you had really amazing eyes. Um, the pink in this image is the gas. 
Um, so galaxy clusters have a huge amount of gas in their center. And so that pink is an X-ray image that shows the, the hot gas. And then the blue is what they've inferred as where the mass of these clusters are using gravitational lensing. So if you use gravitational lensing, you can you can kind of draw out where the, the mass of the galaxy clusters are. And so things like this um, curve shape in the edge of the pink here, this is a shock wave in the gas. Um, and so you can compare the position of the gas, the position of the, the light from the galaxy, so the where the normal matter is, which is, is the light from the galaxies, with the position of, of the mass of the cluster, which is the blue. And they don't all line up. They're in three different, different locations. Um, and so the, the idea here is that the, these two galaxy clusters have kind of collided and they've moved through each other. And so the stars and the galaxies themselves have moved through each other because there's not very many of them. It's unlikely that two galaxies will collide with each other. They're more likely to just move past. Um, and so they've ended up on opposite sides of the image to, to where they started. The gas, similarly, has, has collided, but gas is much closer together. And so the gas um, does interact. The gas from the two clusters will interact with each other. And so you end up with things like this shock wave, this bow shock, um, where that gas is really being held up by the gas that was in the, the other galaxy cluster. And so there, the gas is showing signs of interaction directly. Um, and then the dark matter itself is slightly offset. I think it's behind, the, behind or ahead of the galaxies. Um, and so the mass of the dark matter is offset from the gas because the dark matter doesn't interact with itself. So that's told us, this, this image told us that about dark matter, that it doesn't interact with itself. Um, and so it can just pass straight through as well. Um, and you can, I think they're even starting to try and look at objects like this to measure sort of how sticky is the dark matter, how much does it interact with itself, um, and how much is it delayed behind the galaxies in a collision like this. Um, but that's what those sort of three, three colors are showing there. Uh, that's right and and what's useful about that like you're saying Gideon, this is something i've realized from what you've just said is that you know they're looking at more images like this to try and understand how the dark matter even though it's very weakly interacts and that's why like the thing tim says in the chat about the the wimps there wasn't that weakly interacting massive particles that they thought was a candidate at some point yeah so and again they're trying to infer more about what this candidate should be from these diagrams excellent thanks judy that's right. Have we got time for any more questions? There was a couple more. I have a question yeah. from Rachel. Is that if that's okay? Um, okay Rachel, that the one I was going to say. Go on. Yeah, going right back to sort of the beginning when we were looking at uh, you mentioned about lots of effort went in in uh, the late 20th century to what might happen to the universe. And Rachel's asking what would happen to the size of the universe if the flat model was correct compared to the open model? OK, so that's a great question. Um, and in fact, we probably live in the flat model. So everything we've measured to quite high precision now, and we're not finding any deviation from the flat model, which is kind of interesting in itself, because why would the universe be so finely balanced? But anyway, um, so if you have a, an open um, model of the universe, it will continue expanding at, at further and further and further and further. Um, and it will do so at kind of it's not going to slow down very much. Um, so gravity will have some effect, but not very much because there's not enough gravity to pull it back together. If you have the flat model, then we've got gravity is exactly balanced with that initial, I guess, force of the Big Bang. Um, and so in that case, your universe will expand and expand and expand. And eventually, gravity will just about come strong enough to start to, that it would bring it back down together again but it's not strong enough to actually do it. So it kind of, it stops it expanding forever and it kind of will end up hovered in this in this um, intermediate phase of just finely balanced on the gravity versus the, the initial expansion. Thank you, that's that's great. Okay. Um, over to you, Phil. Any more, no, any more? There is, there is more questions if we've got time, Phil. There's, yeah, there's low. get the questions coming, David. So um, Patrick was asking about whether, when we say 5% of the universe is normal matter, 
do we mean that of the total mass predicted by dark matter and dark energy, only 5% is mass or more energy? Or is it more subtle than that? I'm not sure I really understand the question. Sorry, can you say it again or maybe rephrase so a little bit? It's, um, so when you say the 5% of the universe is normal matter, so I guess talking about percentage, do you mean that the that of the it's five percent of the total mass predicted by dark matter and dark energy, or is it five percent of the mass or mass energy? Is it more subtle than that? Um, so I think we're sort of taught it's it's not necessarily a prediction. Um, right. So we can measure how much energy the entire universe has, and of course, when we're doing this, mass and energy have some equivalence. So we can convert mass into energy and vice versa. Um, so of all of the, the energy or energy density in the universe, 5% of it is, is the normal stuff that we would think of. So it's really, it's 5% of um, what's happening to the universe is that normal stuff. If we just were talking about things that are affected by gravity, then you only need to compare the normal matter and the dark matter and ignore dark energy from that. Right. It takes us nicely to uh, Alexa's question actually and she's asking if dark matter and, and dark energy linked in the same way that normal energy and matter are linked in like a mass energy equivalence? Um, I think so in a way that's not my specialty so I'm not going to give you too confident of an answer on this one. Um, so dark energy is a strange one and I think it's probably a little bit misnamed because it's really, it's not something that's in the universe, it's the fabric of the universe. So I suspect right. that that can't be converted. Dark matter, if it is indeed just matter, then it, it should be, I would have thought, convertible. Um, but it's not going to emit electromagnetic ra radiation. So I'm not sure that you could have an energy in the way that we think of, of energy in the normal sense. So I think we're kind of at the limit of of how we understand these these um, properties to necessarily understand how they might relate to these exotic kinds of material. It's a great area where particle physics and uh, astrophysics meet, I guess. Isn't yeah, it? indeed. Okay, I think um, I'm going to suggest um, that. Uh, we can we can take other questions and I'll I'll email them to Julie and Julie um, that would be excellent answer them back um, okay. because because uh, I I want to to stop at um uh, at four at three o'clock and people are leaving because of uh, going back to teaching um so Julie thank you very much you're welcome really nice thank you all. to hear hear the stories from from a researcher um. If we were in the room, you would all go clap, clap, clap. So could everybody in there just put clap, clap in the chat and we can see <laughs> your appreciation coming through. Thank okay, you. there we go. It's it's coming now. Please, 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 please.